Police and night guards, what strange, odd, and spooky things have you seen? Part 2. Story 8. I do night patrol for a 55 and up community, and I have one woman who is annoying. She will call the front gate to ask me if I can check to see it. She left her glasses in her golf cart, took out her trash, opened her water bottle, and other stupid crap like that. But there was one time I couldn't believe what happened. I just finished locking up the pavilion and I got a call from the front gate that someone was stuck in an elevator. I head over to the building we got a call from and see this lady in her golf cart. I asked her if she called the front gate and she said she did but never said she was stuck in an elevator but at the building. She used the elevator phone to call so we thought someone was stuck. Now here comes the fire department and they are peed off. This guy ripped into the woman about a false call and threatened to tow her golf cart. He says he can smell the battery leaking acid and she said she will get it back to her stall. The fire department leaves and now this woman is expecting me to push her golf cart four buildings away. She is complaining saying the other guards would do it and I said that we are not allowed to lift anything over five pounds. She wants a ride back but I don't want to give her one. I tell her to call her building rep and she complains it is too late at 11.30. After about 20 minutes of listening to her complain, I decide to push her golf cart into the grass and give her a ride back. She then states the reason she was out so late was because she wanted to go to the bank. In my mind, I'm thinking, are you effing kidding me? We get to her place and she starts complaining about my security company and how a unit got robbed in her building. Now I know this woman is crazy because we would have been told about it if that really did happen. I'm not entirely sure how this is strange, odd, or spooky. I mean, unless you're afraid of becoming old and a little senile, which, to be fair, I absolutely am, so I guess, yeah, you got me. Story 9. Was alone in the restaurant I work at one night. Normally, it is never just me, however, we had just gotten some interior remodeling done, so I needed to stay there with the doors locked until open the next day. None of the equipment was on, and it was dead silent. I sat in the office, biding my time. The only things besides the lights that were on were our security cameras. So what did I do? Sat there and watched the cameras. Nothing. Then I thought I heard the locked door to the building open up. I thought maybe the guys that did the remodeling left the door open a crack and someone walked in. Of course, there was no clear view from the camera to the front entrance, so I decided to check myself to make sure. Walked up to the front and was not shocked to see that I was still alone. I checked the doors, locked and secure, when I think I hear the stall door in the men's room close. So, being the dumb AIM, I put my ear to the bathroom door. Nothing. I quietly open the door and step into the bathroom. Nothing. Might as well relieve myself while I'm here, and then I hear the door to the outside sound like it opened again. Walk out again. Nothing. Figure I'm just being paranoid, so I go back to the office and take a seat. I'm watching the cameras like a hawk, barely even having time to blink. One of the cameras starts to go static. Not too uncommon. Then it does something I've never seen in the half a decade I've worked there. Camera goes out. Of course, the camera closes to the office. I quickly hop up and check the landline. No power at base. I shake my head in disbelief. Stand in the doorway listening and holding my breath trying to think what the hell is going on. After a minute or so, I head to the fuse box, open up the box. Yep, blew a fuse, that's it. Flip the switch, phone and camera, came back on, finished my night, and went home. Story 10. Not a police officer or security, I'm a machinist. I worked nights in a shop and was the lucky one that got to stay and lock up after everyone left for the night, usually between 2 to 3 a.m. We had two production buildings. One of them was fine. The other was creepy as crap. After everyone left, I would leave the main safe building and do the secondary creepy building first. As I walked in the back door and came into the machining area, most nights the mills and laser would bang in succession like something was running between them, hitting with a stick on the way by. So I got to walk through there with that going on, making my way to the front of the building where the reception area was to lock the front door. I would pass all the conference rooms. These doors on occasion would be open on my way through, but be closed when I came back by. There was usually banging and pops that could be heard in this area too. The reception area itself was the creepiest. Once I would get into the reception area to the front doors, all the sounds would stop. Like it got really quiet and it felt like I was being watched. I'd lock the doors and hightail it out. Once I got back to the shop floor, all the machines would bang in reverse of what they did when I would come in like whatever was running the other way. Like I said, the other building never makes a noise other than airlines leaking or the usual shop noises. 
One night, I asked another machinist to stay after with me to help out with some stuff. I also brought a camera. This was before phones and cameras were popular. Poor guy was freaking out when the show in the second building started. I took pictures all over the building. The only one that came out abnormal was the reception area. It had to have about 20 orbs in it. Needless to say, dude never stayed to help me close up again. It was creepy, but I never felt in danger. <sighs> you had my interest up until the orbs. Folks, I can't prove ghosts don't exist, and I can't prove that orbs aren't something spectacular. But there are such easy explanations for orbs, and they are just the least convincing evidence of anything to me. I know lots of people swear by them, but they are just too easily explained away for me. Sorry. Story 11. As told to me by my friend, before moving to the city, he used to stay in his ancestral house in a village. The people there had a tradition where on a particular day of the year, everyone in the village would make dinner, transfer a part into small earthen pots, and leave it on a small platform on the village outskirts for the souls. The eldest son in a family is the one who delivers the food. They are properly warned to not look to the sides or turn back, but walk in a straight line to the platform and back. They are also not to pay heed to voices taunting them, too. So it happens that my friend and a cousin of his are on their way delivering food to the platform, and he swears that he heard voices calling out to them. Since they were instructed to not look back, they didn't, but apparently one of the guys in the group did, and all the rest of them heard was a swoosh and a scream. They crapped their pants in terror, but did not look back, somehow managed to deliver the food, and ran back to their homes. My friend swore that everyone in the village could hear the boys' screams the whole night, but everyone was afraid to come out to investigate. It was as if somebody's soul was being ripped into pieces. The next morning, everyone woke up to find the decapitated body of the young guy in the village square, and his head was found on the small platform in the outskirts. The police came and investigated, but did not find any forensic evidence of involvement of humans or animals in his death. There were telltale scars on the body, but nothing that looked to have been made by a human or an animal. The case still remains as one of the unsolved mysteries in the books of the police. I'm not sure whether to believe it or not, but my friend is never known to tell a lie or exaggerate. That just means he's a good liar. But seriously, I like stories and folklore like this. Would love to hear more about where this happened and more about the culture and their beliefs. Story 12. I work nights alone, but with a sleeping co-worker I can wake up in case of emergencies at a home for developmentally challenged adults, helping them out with whatever needs to be done, which usually isn't all that much since they sleep. I'm not armed in any way, would not want to be, and I'm around 5'7 and 140 pounds of pure love. One of the residents, a very autistic gentleman, sometimes has the habit of coming out and asking me in the middle of the night if he can sleep in if he doesn't have to get up in the morning, like if it's a weekend or his stay-at-home day. He likes to be reassured that he doesn't have to get up as he hates mornings. He sleeps with his socks on and has a very light shuffling gait which is almost completely inaudible. On a night shift, I'm sitting in the main room watching a television program about political analysis with all of my attention on the program. All of a sudden, right next to my left ear, a soft voice whispers out, Can I sleep in tomorrow morning? and I just jumped 10 feet out of my chair. This guy had snuck up on me, obviously, without meaning any harm, but I'd had to explain to him that that was a very bad idea and that he should let his presence be known because I couldn't guarantee that I might not react differently and perhaps strike out at him uh, out of instinct if he ever did something like that again. Fortunately, he got the point. He still sneaks around, but now stops some 15 feet from where I am to ask his usual question if he can sleep in. Usually I know when he leaves his room as the hallway light turns on by a motion sensor, but on that night I was facing away from that particular hallway. Story 13. I was volunteering during the summer back in high school at a nearby theater. They were going to be doing a musical. Always wondered why all the singers smoked heavily. And I had some carpentry experience, so I was helping out their tech crew building scenery. There was a loading dock behind this little kink of a hallway which led directly onto stage left and on the loading dock was a couple of coke machines where people tended to congregate, usually on their way out for a smoke or coming back in from one. I passed them going between the tech building where we built the scenery and the theater where we installed it, probably 20 to 30 times a day. I'm working late one evening and I'm running through a couple cans of spackle to the drywall on stage, and the guys are waiting on me. 
I catch a dark-haired woman in a white lace gown standing there just staring at one of the coke machines an instant before I barge into her. I apologize and give a quick smile as I jink around her and keep going. It takes all of two seconds from start to finish and I'm not really paying attention to her since I've got other things on my mind. As I'm working, I mention that it seemed a bit early for dress rehearsals. My boss Richard gives me an odd look and says dress rehearsals aren't for another two weeks. I mention the woman in the dress and Richard goes blank. He takes me out to the theater's administration wing and points to a wall of portraits where a picture of the woman is. The children's theater next door had been named after her. She was a lifelong actress who had married the man who built the theater I was standing in. She died in 1985. I'm not gonna lie, while I love to talk a big game about being a skeptic, I cannot help but be really drawn in by theater ghosts. Maybe it's because I was a theater kid, but like, theater ghost stories are always some of the most interesting to me. Probably because they are usually being relayed to me by actors. <laughs> Story 14. We have this legend called the White Wives. They're ghostly women in white night robes that haunt the open fields and moors. Variations of this myth actually exist in a lot of places. I say myth because we know exactly what they are. When the weather conditions are right, we sometimes get very small shards of fog that rise up from wet spots in the fields and moors. So instead of a big fog bank, you get a small patch of dense fog the size of a horse or a person. The wind can blow these little shards of fog across the fields, causing them to billow like ghostly white robes in the moonlight. One night I'm cycling home past the fields on the edge of town when I catch movement from the corner of my eye. I look and it's a goddamn ghost keeping pace with me. Billowing white robes, deep sunken pits where I imagine a face staring at me. And the thing is keeping pace, just rushing through the fields parallel to my bike maybe 12 feet to my side. It took me maybe half a minute before I got a hold of myself and realized I was actually seeing a white wife for the first time. I learned two things that night. I totally understand where ghosts myths come from. It looks so unnatural, the way it kept pace with me due to the wind, the way it kept changing shape like robes billowing in the wind, the way the moonlight made it glow. The second is that phrases like terror taking an icy grip on your heart are not just fancy words. When I looked to my side and saw that thing rushing along, I felt like something reached into my chest and squeezed my heart in a cold fist for a second. Story 15. I was doing guard duty in the army one night. We had some training exercises in an abandoned camp facility and my buddy and I had been assigned to watch over some vehicles that we had parked in a large empty warehouse. We were the only ones in that camp facility as there was nothing else valuable that had to be watched overnight. My buddy and I had tied hammocks between the vehicles to get a bit more comfortable for the overnight watch when we suddenly saw a pack of wild dogs standing outside the doors to the warehouse. Now these doors were wide open and nothing was stopping the dogs from coming in at all, but they just stood there, 15 to 20 dogs lined up at the entrance to the abandoned warehouse, watching us. Suddenly, as if someone had flipped a switch, they all started barking and howling in our direction. I set out direction because when we discussed it later with him, we both agreed that it felt like the dogs were barking at something else in the entirely abandoned warehouse. My buddy and I were completely terrified, first that we might have gotten swarmed by the dogs, and second at whatever the F those dogs were barking at. We started to radio for help, but suddenly the pack of dogs stopped barking and left. It was as if they had never been there. That was a long night of guard duty, I can tell you. Please leave your story in the comments, I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.